Dental Speaker Bureau's Facebook page. Um, the Buzz, we bring you um, experts in our industry and a wide variety of uh, current important topics. And today I'm really excited to bring our colleague and friend and mentor and infection control expert extraordinaire, <laughs> Leslie Cannon. Leslie, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you for having me, Vanessa. Absolutely. Now, um, I know that you are someone who t speaks in the area of dental compliance, regulation, and uh, different types of training, um, and definitely around infection control. For years, I've followed uh, the courses that you do, and you have some really fun activities you do in your courses. I remember seeing like with the, the gloves and some of the, the fun things that, that you guys do, and have Mocha with you at the, at the presentations, your dog, and um, I, it's just really fun. Um, and so, of course, I thought of you um, when recently in the last couple of weeks, when we're recording this now, we're near the end of March 2020. And in the last couple of weeks, of course, worldwide, um, our world has shifted very much changed because of the uh, novel uh, coronavirus. And so I appreciate you coming today to share with our listeners um, some information on what we can do now and where we can go. Uh, before we uh, jump into that, though, I, I would ask if you could just give us a, a little um, nutshell version of what is it in, in your experience, in your life, that brought you to be someone who studies and be, became an expert in infection control? Oh, and Thanks for joining us here. Hey, Bob Pick, and I can't see everyone's uh, faces that are joining. We have several viewers already listening in, Leslie. Please yeah. do say hello in the comments. And if you have any questions for Leslie as we go, please pop them in there and we'll make sure that we um, that we get those answered for you. So, Leslie, give us a, a, the thumbnail. How did you get to this place in your life? Well, you know, actually, I was working in a dental office and they needed somebody to be the OSHA coordinator. And I took on that responsibility. I started doing the training for my staff and dentists in my area, in my neighborhood, found out that I was training teams on safety and OSHA compliance. And they asked me to come into their offices and Did train you know, their teams. I'm super excited. Yeah. That's how I first got started, uh, but I expanded into speaking about infection control because I realized you can't really talk about OSHA without having a good foundation in infection control. And I found a wonderful resource for getting that information called OSAP, the Organization for Safety of Sepsis and Prevention. And I attended their symposium and I studied their materials and I attended their boot camp. And this was all about 20 years ago. And it just ignited an interest in me, in, in my brain. I just, a light went off that, you know, infectious diseases are scary and viruses and bacteria are amazing in the way that they can replicate and how they can uh, mutate. And so I started studying a little bit about pandemics over 20 years ago. And so uh, today I am now uh, helping dental practices with their day-to-day -day infection control, but, uh, but still I've been watching the trends of what happens worldwide with, started out with, uh, my interest was peaked by SARS in 2002. And then in, uh, in 2009, we had swine flu. And I was actually on my way to speak at a dental meeting for the American Association of Orthodontists in Boston. It happened that swine flu had just hit. It wasn't in, a, a near the pandemic that it is that we have with our coronavirus today, but uh, it was still a very big concern. And uh, they'd asked me on short notice to change my, my lecture from the infection control lecture. They said, can you tell us, can you talk to us about swine flu? And so I was able to very quickly change my presentation and uh, give them information that was valuable and, and pertinent and applicable to what was happening at, at that time. Mm. It really is very fascinating, isn't it? I mean, just um, were you a, were you someone who loved science in school? 
Yeah, uh, I did. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm finding with the different people I talk to who are infection control experts. See, that that was like not my forte. I just could my head, but I'll just say I was young for my grade and I wasn't ready to grasp it yet. But <laughs> I uh, that was not me. But as an adult now, I mean, I really do find that um, it's fascinating. If we can separate ourselves from the emotion around what's happening, it really is fascinating when you sit back and evaluate what's happening. And especially to think, there's ways that we can control certainly the spread, you know, or, or maybe even keep this from happening again. Are there any important lessons that we could can learn from um, not only a coronavirus, but just from the past? Is there anything that you could tell us about where we've been as a, as a culture and a society um, that we might draw some inspiration or learning from? Well, the first thing I want to say is that most of us are already doing all the right things with infection control. And over the last uh, probably 40 years or so, if you think about going back to the 80s when we were first uh, introduced to HIV and uh, during the 80s, most of us weren't wearing gloves and didn't have masks or clinical jackets or protective eyewear. And by the 90s, we all had all of those things. Yeah. And we were afraid at that time. We were nervous about working with patients. We didn't know if we would get sick or get infected as a result of working on a patient who was HIV positive. And as we learned how to manage, which at that time was called universal precautions, uh, which has evolved to the term standard precautions, uh, we realized that when we treat patients, we already have safeguards in place. Not only are we wearing proper personal protective equipment, but we're also spending time diligently disinfecting surfaces and cleaning instruments and sterilizing them appropriately and presenting our dental practices uh, in, in a manner that shows that we have concern for patient safety, that we take care of all of the necessary steps. So in the past, we learned at that point, and now where we are today, I think almost every dental office is practicing standard precautions. Now, sometimes we get a little lax and we may skip a few steps or or not be thinking of, of doing things that we should be doing and get busy and get caught up in the day and the busyness of the schedule. So sometimes that uh, fine tuning our training and, and our skills reminds us of, of making sure that we don't miss anything, that we don't have any gaps. Mm. Absolutely. And, and so we're saying we need to learn from what's worked well and what's not worked well. And I want to say with full transparency, I'm having one of those moments right now, Leslie, where I've been looking and looking to try to figure out why I'm not live on Dental Speakers Bureau page. And I'm realizing that <laughs> this is going to be good speech material <laughs> for me sometime soon. I've actually gone live on Dental Speaker Institute <laughs> with the wrong copy. So I'm just going to call out in full transparency. Vanessa flubbed this one up. So here's what our post should say. And I'll change this when we're done. And you guys feel free. Please laugh with me. Um, what it was intended to say, those of you who are watching probably figured out this is not Manal. <laughs> We have, well, what it's supposed to say is never has there been a more important time to focus on infection prevention. It's a top of mind and, you know, top of everyone's uh, conversations right now. Um, so uh, just wanted to call that out. And thank you all for, for joining us here at Dental Speaker Institute. So uh, I wanted to thank Carrie and Mindy and Bob and those of you who are commenting here. Please do and let us know if you have any questions for Leslie. And I'll, I'll fix my flow. <laughs> thank you guys for being patient. So... We've learned from the past some things and maybe we can learn more from the past and we certainly will learn from what's happening right now. So uh, it feels to me and see, and does it feel similar to you, Leslie, that we're kind of in this limbo land? It feels it's a strange place where um, it's hard to be goal oriented because we're not really sure what the landscape is going to look like. You know, as a speaker or consultant or planner, it's kind of hard to know when will we go back to work? You know, there are many things that are out of our control. But there are things that are in our control that we can do now. As that relates to the dental professional, um, what is within our control that we can do right now today to be able to move our practices forward? Well, you know, there's never been a better time to conduct team training. And I realize that a lot of practices have employees that have either been laid off or furloughed uh, or uh, 
just maybe they're keeping their team on the uh, payroll, but they're they're doing uh, if they're not sheltered at, in home like we are here in California, that they're doing uh, spring cleaning and and uh, you know, accounts receivable and collecting you know from insurance companies where they can, where the insurance companies are not you know, sheltered at home as well. Uh, but uh, what would really make a lot of sense would be to not only look at your infection control program, but understand that our patients are looking at us as well. Years ago, when I first started my path in uh, infection prevention and OSHA safety, people would ask me what I do for a living. And I told them that I like to speak on and train dental teams on infection control. And they thought that what I meant by infection control was wound management or um, antibiotic mm -hmm. Uh, stewardship. Yeah, right. But uh, <laughs> today, everybody understands the word infection control. Same thing with the word PPE, personal protective equipment. There was you know, hardly anybody outside of, of uh, the medical field or veterinarian or dental understood really what that acronym was. And, and I had to be careful to make sure that I spelled it out in my presentations because actually some people within our field didn't recognize that uh, PPE meant personal protective equipment. But today, everybody's hearing about it. Also, hand hygiene. That was something that has been, I think, probably about the last 10 years since swine flu hit, we've been hearing a lot of uh, information on, on how to appropriately perform hand hygiene. So I, our patients are have a heightened awareness now. And uh, when, when we do return to the regular delivery of the business of providing dental care, we need to know that they're watching us. And simple things like, like not touching your face, that's a hard thing not to do. And so uh, our, our patients will notice those little things. If we're wearing gloves, if we you know, unknowingly uh, touch something causing cross-contamination, we aren't thinking of it, but our patients are gonna see that. So it's not only making sure that we're still doing the good work that we do every day, the good job of sterilizing and disinfecting surfaces and, and wearing the PPE the right way all the time, you know, not just wearing it part of the time. We need to make sure also that we're doing things the right way. Uh, I see when I visit a dental practice, um, I'll see the PPE not being worn correctly. Sometimes the mask is below the nose or regular prescription glasses instead of appropriate uh, protective eyewear. Um, I'll also see disinfectants that are not being used the right amount of time or the right way. So this, these are the things that are simple to correct. We just need to sit down and simply talk about it. And now we can do that because we actually have the time to do it. Whereas during the typical busy dental day, you know, our production kind of carries us away. And before we know it, it's the end of the day, the end of the week or the end of the year. Right, right. And so for things that we can do right now, I feel like a lot of our colleagues are making it easy for dentists to be able to um, either do a virtual meeting with them and their team or making their recorded content available. And certainly so many um, our, our speaker consultant colleagues are reaching out to everyone that they work with and just, you know, staying in touch. I mean, that's part of it. Um, it feels to me like there's a real opportunity for the dental practice owner who's wanting to keep their team united to pull together even like a weekly meeting or something where via Zoom they could all get together and bring someone in to teach them for an hour some of these things, you know, or or somehow make that training available to their team. I think that it just makes sense. I picture it as, um, and I've said this, I, I'm sure on multiple other lives, I picture it like hopping on that horse at a gallop when, when we're able to reopen the office. I think it would be so smart to be ahead of that curve as much as we can so that we don't have a slow ramp up, but so that we can just get right back in and get back to the business of dentistry and helping our patients. Would you agree? Absolutely. And so we want to make sure that we have uh, gone through our systems and made sure that our protocols are efficient and our team is uh, well trained. And not only that, but well versed to be able to respond to questions that patients will have about their safety in our care. 
and uh, everybody uh, speaking uh, with the same, uh, you know, the same language here, being on the same page, again, uniting the team so that they have the skills that they need, not only the clinical skills, but the verbal skills to address the concerns that will come up, will inevitably come up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to make sure I hear kids outside, which is a wonderful so sound. Do you hear the kids screaming and playing basketball? Because I'll shut my window if we need. Are we okay? On this? I'm, I'm good. Nobody's telling me it's a hard, hard to hear, but you guys let me know if it's hard to hear. Um, right now, it just feels good to hear kids laughing outside. Um, so one thought I just had with that, uh, you know, as far as other things we could do right now, I thought how... Um, really relatively easy it would be for the dentist or practice owner to, in front of a computer, um, just create their own little uh, um, video that they can share with their uh, um, clients. So mm -hmm. what am I trying to say? Patients. <laughs> to share with their patients now, to help stay in front of their patients. We're all getting all kinds of emails every day, you know, still boatloads of emails about their COVID response. What if, uh, what if the, um, the dental practice had someone who created um, a video response, you know, just even weekly to stay in touch with their patients, to let them know how we're preparing to be ready for you. Um, you know, I'm, I'm an idea person. <laughs> I don't know how practical they'll find that and how hard that would be to pull together, but it feels like Zoom or something like that would be a pretty easy way to, to stay in touch. And certainly that's going to help the dental practice in the long run to stay with in front of those patients. Well, so tell me more about, um, looks like we're doing okay on our sound. And thank you guys for your, your comments. And I, I'm afraid I don't see who, who's commenting. So let us know um, who's here. And I'm getting some good comments on appreciating the, the content, Leslie. So we've talked about the past. We're talking about today um, where we're at in, in the, the moment, the what is of, of our lives right now. Yeah. Certainly, we all would like it to be different than this overall um, moving forward. And so when we get to a place where we can get back to the office, uh, what are the steps we should be taking now to prepare for that? And when we hop back in at the office, do you have guidance for, for practices? What are some of the first things they'll need to do? Well, we might want to take a look at our reception room. Infection control shows first in the reception room. So if you're a practice now where we're talking about uh, some of the practices are open for seeing emergency patients, uh, patients that are actually in pain, uh, to stage your reception room and perhaps put the furniture six feet or so apart, remove anything that can't be disinfected, like magazines and toys, uh, you know, disinfect frequently touched surfaces, doorknobs. Uh, maybe you might remove the coffee maker if you have a, a, a patient comfort center or, or refrigerator with bottled water to remove those things. And if you're gonna have bottled water, offer it to the patient when uh, they arrive and offer for them to be able to wash their hands or use alcohol hand sanitizer. Uh, you know, again, it gives a, a, a unique uh, con a perspective of infection control. For the patient is going to see that, that we are concerned about their health in our reception room, as well as when we're performing dentistry. And uh, the other things, I know this has been mentioned many, many times, but I'm getting my resources also from the American Dental Association's website and from the OSAP website, uh, that, that if we do have to see an emergency patient, have them wait in their car until it's time to bring them in, uh, schedule patients that are emergencies farther apart from each other so they're not passing each other in the reception room. I was actually, I went to the bank the other day, actually, I called ahead of time because I wasn't sure if they would be open. And uh, they said, well, yeah, these are the hours, but Leslie, you have to make an appointment because we're limiting only one customer in our lobby at a time. And they said, we'll give you an appointment, but you wait outside until somebody comes out to get you. And then, uh, of course, we'll make the next person wait until you're done before we let them in. And I thought, well, you know, that really does convey a, a strong message of, of you know, uh, infection transmission safety. And so I was very, uh, you know, instead of being aggravated by that, uh, I was pretty uh, impressed by it. So when we get past this and, and we're not, uh, you know, only seeing emergency patients, then when we do come back to the regular business of delivering dentistry, I think that still having the tissue in the reception room and the alcohol hand sanitizer, a waste basket that we're mindful to uh, dispose frequently during the day, 
that we have someone that that takes a look at our reception room as on our team to see that, you know, does it look messy out there? Uh, and again, to uh, make a show of frequently disinfecting surfaces, whether it be with a spray disinfectant or a wipe. And uh, you know, I actually, I saw a YouTube video that had millions of hits and it was two dental assistants using disinfectant spray around the front desk and the reception area talking about how they were doing everything they could. And this was, this was earlier this month. You know, mm -hmm. first questions that came off around my desk early in March was, uh, um, is it okay to see patients? I mean, how do we know that we're not gonna get exposed to somebody that has coronavirus? And then the following week, it was, um, we're not able to order enough PPE. And what are we going to do? Because we have patients on the books and our dental supplier is limiting us. And then the following week, it was, well, <laughs> we're not able to work in our offices. So I guess that takes care of, of you know, the concern PPE. about PPE. And so it, it's like yesterday, as you mentioned, today and tomorrow. And so today where we're at, we can utilize our downtime a number of ways. Uh, we may still have to see patients. We may we, we still have a team that needs to know that, that we're going to resume dentistry and that, you know, all those patients that we had to cancel, when they come back, where are we going to put them? And we're not going to have enough uh, days in the week and hours in the day and, and operatories to put everybody whose appointments were canceled as a result, or, you know, our practices are interrupted. So it's true. We do need to get things ramped up and be prepared in advance because a patient might ask, does your disinfectant kill coronavirus? So we need to be prepared with the appropriate answer and maybe just a little bit more, whether we're the hygienist that maybe has a degree in biology or microbiology, or whether we're the newest dental assistant who got trained on the job. We need to have the information and be able to uh, provide our patients with the confidence that, that we ourselves are exhibiting because we ourselves are, are gonna be confident in providing care for patients and know that we're doing all the right things and that they're safe in our care. Mm, I love that. There were so many great things in there. It makes me think how, um my major overall message is there never has been a better time to you guys fill in the blank for instance teach scheduling <laughs> for you know it's like the phone skills there's like all of these skills that we may feel like they're not really uh, um pertinent to the emergency of with the health crisis but yet it's all important how are we as a team going to handle the phone the phone calls that come in uh how, how are we going to um, handle the overload of, of patients that we expect? Well, you know, it's, it's certainly, and, and it's going to require more time because everybody wants to talk about it and, and everyone's going to need to be soothed. And, and that's why it just feels to me like there never has been a more important time to be a speaker or consultant in this industry. And there's never been a more important time, I think, to be a planner. Um, and I would love to chat with you a little bit more about um, that side of things, because, you know, certainly we're, speakers and consultants, um, and some of us are also planners, but I'm hearing through the Bureau from some organizations that are looking for help with how do I provide a virtual meeting? I have a society with thousands of members. You know, we were supposed to have our meeting this month and they need their CE. And so um, certainly we're pulling together at the Bureau and for the Institute on the speaker and consultant side, we're pulling together resources around how what what's available there. But I thought it'd be smart to mention um, to our uh, planners in the room, whether you're planning for a study club and maybe it's a couple dozen attendees or it's a society with, you know, hundreds potential, um, know that most speakers can flex. As I've talked to, to people, the only place I see and see if you feel the same around this, Leslie, um, but I find that most speakers would be really happy to help right now. And as long as what they offer is something that's either lecture or workshop, not clinical workshop, but something that's more like, a, you know, an interactive session for teams and that sort of thing, that it feels like there's a there's a real opportunity for speakers to help and planners to get that required CE to their members. And it's really an opportunity for us to work together. Do you agree? I agree. And, uh, you know, actually, it's funny you should mention that because as all of my live speaking engagements in front of audiences for dental associations and societies 
flew off my calendar for the next two months, or actually almost the next three months. Um, a lot of it was converted to webinar. And I'm, I'm fluent in webinar. I've been doing webinars for probably 12 years now. So I've, I've, I'm very <laughs> I love that. Fluent in, you're fluent in webinar. I've not heard that one. I, I, I like that term. <laughs> uh, so I've been giving um, a couple or three webinars each day because not only is this a way to get the information out, but the members of most of these associations are, are saying, well, now, how do I get my live classroom credit? Uh, I was counting on going to the meeting. And so they're calling the component executive directors asking, you know, and, and in their, from what I heard earlier uh, this week, they were in tears because they're not going to be able to get their, I mean, home study, you know, that you can get about you know, a certain amount in certain states, they allow uh, that. Uh, California allows one half as home study, but the rest has to be live. And live webinars count the teleconferences count as live CE credit, live classroom credit. Uh, I actually gave a webinar this morning. There was over uh, 300 uh, people and uh, they, they just, they seemed like they were so happy to get the CEs. I was speaking on coronavirus and, and you know, all of the updated information on, with disinfectants and, and uh, masks and N95s and, and all of that. And uh, they've actually asked me to repeat that. that I've been um, asked several times to repeat the, uh, the webinar and, and provide it for another audience. So I've been busy. My uh, component executive directors have been able to take care of their members who are worried and uh, and of course they get their CE credit. Um, I'm happy to provide it. I've been doing it for a long time, so you know it's easy for me. I I, I enjoy being in front of people. There's no doubt having a live audience and having you know, hands-on engagement and participation is is fun. But you know actually right now everybody is trying something new, and we're in a, a highly technological world where we can FaceTime and Facebook and do a meeting like we're doing here. And so uh, it, it, it's, it, there's ways to get it done. I mean, even doctors with their team can FaceTime uh, the team or have a Zoom meeting and, and uh, everyone's in their own home, but they can still connect virtually and be able to get the training that they need. So again, it's it's a good time to uh, to think about getting uh, that information virtually to the members. Uh, they need the message now. They need the information now, and uh, and and it's something to do. I mean, we can't sit on the couch and watch TV all day. Well, maybe <laughs> some of us can. <laughs> no, we can Netflix binge. <laughs> uh, you know, I think you're right. Absolutely, more than ever, um, our voices are needed. And, uh, and our knowledge is needed. And I, my heart has been just so um, warmed and full when I look around the industry and I see how so many of our colleagues are reaching out and, and slashing their prices or they're creating new interim programs that they're just sharing um, just to help us get through. I have no doubt this industry is going to emerge stronger than ever. Do you, do, how do you feel? I think so. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, okay. Well, so before we wrap up, um, is there anything I haven't asked you, Leslie, that I should have around this? And maybe you can leave us with, um, you know, if there's anything I missed, but also what do you feel is the critical piece, the most important piece today, uh, near the end of March 2020? What's as a, Because this is shifting all the time. What's the most important piece today? be educated on on what it is our patients are hearing you know they they're looking to us to lead the way and and to have the right answers the resources are available i'm a resource certainly i have several training programs on on infection control and safety and osha etc very easy to find me on my website uh, but also stay abreast of what the uh, trusted resources that we have available to us are saying and stay frequently uh, connected to the American Dental Association website, the CDC website. Um, there's another great resource and I almost don't want to give up my secret sauce, but I, I mentioned OSEP, the Organization for Safety of Sepsis and Prevention. They have a certificate training, which would be ideal for at least one clinical team member to take that is an infection prevention certificate and it's it can be done online and at the end of the training you take a test and you get a certificate that uh, is actually describes you as being an expert in infection prevention in dentistry 
There's also another uh, little kind of tip I want to leave everybody with on the OSAP website. They have opened up their website to everyone. You don't have to be a member. You can click on every single link and, and just absorb every bit of great information, see frequently asked questions, and great get some great checklists and charts and all those posters. It's sort of a one-stop shopping place to be able to get the links to all the other uh, resources I mentioned, like uh, like ADA and CDC. So you know, educate yourself, uh, stay ahead of the game, uh, stay ahead of the curve for uh, be anticipating what your patients are going to be asking you, and and have the right answers for them. You, you want to be credible. Hmm. I'm OSAP, and that makes me think. As far as virtual trainings, uh, Kevin Henry and I spoke at OSAP virtually. Do you remember that? It was had to have been. I do. It was like seven or eight years ago because it was in between uh, SCN and Catherine's wedding. There was just a couple days and I couldn't get there to Baltimore from Phoenix. And way back seven or eight years ago for a big national conference, they brought Kevin and I in for a pre-conference session. I remember you had referred me as well as Karen Daw, and I really appreciate that. But I want to point that out because... Um, you just reminded me of that, but also the fact that it's really not hard to take your meeting virtual. There's so many technique, uh, techniques out there and technology, and there'll be more about that coming here on DSI and the Bureau um, Facebook uh, page and group over the weekend. I'm, I'm pulling together some um, web pages to be able to share more uh, of that with you all. Now, Leslie, you really have been ahead of the curve uh, for this for some time where you've been doing um, both on-site training as well as virtual. So I, I find that um, maybe I could just explain that those the, there's really three areas and I find that not everybody's clear about this. We're talking about there's live training when you go speak at the event. There's recorded training where someone comes to your website or Kajabi or somewhere and watches, but this whole area in the middle needs to expand the virtual, right? Like the, that's like the live streaming at conferences or like what you and I are doing right now would really be a virtual meeting. It's live, but it's online. And I know you've been doing that for some time as well. I was really impressed um, recently when I saw something through Facebook where you'd done a little bit of marketing and you had greatly reduced your prices, um, which uh, kudos, uh, thank you uh, for for, for doing that um, and, and really helping to fill a need. Um, I find that um, we, we don't always feel comfortable where like some, some of us feel that we really should just give it away right now. And I'm going to tell you, I'm not in that camp. I feel like um, we have to keep the economy going. We have to keep the economy growing. And so I want to encourage uh, those out there who are listening um, I think it's great to offer your content, but you need to be able to get something for that. And and you're out there leading the way, Leslie. Thank you for showing us a great example. I think you slashed your prices in half on your webinars. Do I remember that correctly? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we took it about, about half so that we could uh, accommodate people who don't have an income or or some of the doctors who are worried about their income next month. And I wanted to make sure that uh, the information was available. It's it's information that they want and need right now. And uh, you know the cost of, of getting the training, you know, sometimes it's actually less to do the virtual training than to get in your car and drive somewhere and pay for a hotel or, or meals or parking and then attend a meeting. I mean, it's always nice to do that. I love doing that, but uh, I find that uh, people save a lot of money this way. And I, I wanted to make sure that they still knew that they could save money uh, and get the education that they really need right now. And uh, license renewal, uh, I'll tell you, the California Dental Board sent a, an email out to their licensees that um, we understand that you may not be able to get your live continuing education credit because meetings have been canceled, but we're not going to extend your license renewal. You're going to have to still renew on time and you'll find virtual courses and teleconferences that can fill in the void from being uh, alive at a, at a classroom training. Yeah, let's hope they weren't due in March <laughs> and scrambling, right? Because we have a couple more days in this month. But what, what an um, what an opportunity for speakers and consultants to lead. What an opportunity for the meeting planners out there to really serve their membership. Um, you know, I think it's it's time, it's past time for us to embrace virtual. Um, we 
we're sitting at our desks <laughs> anyway. Uh, there's there's so many great platforms too, which I'll share more um, over the weekend, but where you can even break people off into table groups where they can hear each other and then they come back to the group and share. I mean, there's uh, Catherine I tell that will be so proud that I found some things where we can use our lioness principle training <laughs> uh, to be able to get a lot of interaction even through virtual. So um, Leslie, uh, Tell us how we can find you. How can how can we connect with you if you want more information about your programs or if we want to reach out to you via your, your phone or your website or email? Either way. Okay, so I'm Leslie at LeslieCannum.com. And my website is www.LeslieCannum.com. My phone number is 209-785-3903. Awesome. So, and your email is leslie at lesliecannum.com. It's all super okay. easy. Okay. Awesome. Well, so before we go, I just want to thank you for taking time. I know that um, you are super busy right now. I'm seeing you all over Facebook and <laughs> uh, the inf our infection control experts in the industry are certainly well um, needed right now. And so thank you for taking time with us to do this today. My pleasure, Vanessa. Thank you so much for having me. And goodbye, everybody. And remember, don't shake hands. It's it's jazzy hands. No That's more jumping right. either. So <laughs> That's right. That's too close. <laughs> I know, right? You can't really elbow bump when you're six feet away. Um, so for anyone who would like to find out a little bit more about Leslie's presentations, you can find her at dentalspeakersbureau.com. And then you can look her up alphabetically, Canham, C-A-N-H-A-N. Or you can reach out to me, um, info at dental speakersbureau.com. I'm Vanessa Emerson, founder of Dental Speakers Bureau. And um, I'm going to push this video on over where it's supposed to be. <laughs> so don't you guys just love it? I mean, the, the this is the reality is our boomers like myself are learning how to really utilize technology. If there's anything wonderful that comes out of all this, it's going to be the fact that millennials, I think, will understand more, or not understand, but like appreciate more connection the face-to-face -face connection and we boomers are being forced to understand more about technology. <laughs> so there will be great things, great things that come out of it. Well, thanks so much again for being here, everyone. Um, and until next time, thank you, Leslie and yeah. everyone be well. Bye -bye. I know we'll do this. Bye-bye. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Bye-bye.